right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 972nd monthly meeting of Atmob. Our guest speaker tonight will be Miranda Iden, telling a tale of two telescopes. Uh, I think we'll have Ken Lani speak during old business, and he'll inform us about some details that tonight's a pretty special meeting, marking the, the 100th year anniversary of the Bond Club, and we'll have more details on that later. So that's it's an incredible history of our clubs combined. So we have a standard agenda, nothing atypical. Oh. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that guy. Okay. This was partly Glenn's idea and partly my handiwork. I discovered a thing called stickers on my phone. Um, so I actually get that. <laughs> See, there you go. I get it. I was going to say three old goats and a young goat. <laughs> did you guys, did you get creeped on all that thing behind you? That was the least creepy thing in the room. <laughs> There's no way to talk about sound. Corey, Corey, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Glenn, go ahead. Just a Johannes Kepler, some of you may have heard of the man. He was a personal good friend. <laughs> the treasures hidden in the heavens are so rich that the human mind shall never be lacking in fresh nourishment. And that holds true today as it did way back then. And then we'll continue. I think it's all yours now. All the well, things for a little while. I got to, this button does it now. Which one? The down button. The down button, okay. So these are. this is the clubhouse schedule for the there's next... There's a laser. Um, okay. Oh, there's a laser on top. Oh, yeah, right there. Um, the only date that we have tentative, there's nothing, uh, nobody is assigned to the April 5th, 6th, uh, Friday, Saturday night uh, schedule because we figure most people are going to be traveling uh, for the eclipse. But if you're around and, you're, and it's clear and you're interested in opening up the clubhouse, just throw out an, uh, an email uh, on the announce list and, you know, just to let people know that you're up there and the place will be open. Um, but there they are. They're in the newsletter and uh, they're on the event calendar as well. Then, so... Here are the observing highlights of the planet roundup. Mercury is going to reach greatest elongation east at 18.6 degrees on the 24th of March. If you've never seen Mercury or if you've seen it very infrequently, this is a great opportunity to do so. Because in the springtime, in the evening, in the northern hemisphere, the ecliptic stands very high, uh, up about a 70 degree angle to the horizon. Which means that 18.6 degrees away from the sun, puts the planet up very close to, you know, 18 degrees above the horizon at sunset, meaning um, it's a great opportunity to see it. So, you know, check it out. It's, you can see the date, well, I'm not going to say daytime. The Mercury is actually brightest when it's on the far side of the sun. So if you, um, you want to try for it in the daytime, uh, now is not the time to do it. But uh, we can talk about that some other time. <coughs> Jupiter shining at minus magnitude 2.1, currently setting about 10.30. Solar conjunction is May 18th, try observing an hour before sunset. I was looking at Jupiter this afternoon at 3.30. So I just alt azimuth it with my Dobsonian, and there it was. In the, I, I used an 80 millimeter finer scope on that telescope, but I could see it clearly in the finer scope, and the scene was terrible, but I could see the cloud belts, and it was just me still proving I could do it. Uranus sets around 11 o'clock, and Venus shines at magnitude minus 3.9. It's about 20 degrees away from the sun, and again, try daytime observing. I looked at Venus the other morning, very easy to find, very bright, easy to spot in your finder scope. It's still 20 degrees away from the sun. The upcoming solar conjunction in June, Venus will be occulted by the sun. So we won't be able to really see it on the day of superior conjunction, which is a dangerous <coughs> sport anyway. Um, but you can watch it as it approaches solar conjunction if you learn to find it in the daytime. Um, it's probably safer to wait till after solar conjunction when it's following the sun across the sky, right? So you don't have to worry about the sun kind of creeping up on you because that's a bad thing. Um, anyway, you should try it. I think you should really try it. Um, what else is going on? Comet Pons Brook, Brooks is now moving through. This is, um, this is Andromeda here. This is Mirac, the Andromeda galaxies up here uh, across... Um, Pisces through Aries during the month of March. Um, it's still relatively faint, um, but the comet has cryovolcanoes and it's been very prone to eruptions. And so there, we've seen large increases in brightness over the last six months. So that's something to pay attention to in the news notes that, that flash up. Check out Sky and Telescope's website. Um, they keep us up to date pretty nicely. But it's a good comet to go out and look at. It won't be back for another 70 years. So if you miss it this time, 
Mm. So, already Glenn, good. <clears throat> Glenn. Oh, do you have pictures of it? Yes. He's a pro. Cool. Uh, <coughs> I just wanted to say, uh, surprisingly, I got a text. Uh, it was either this morning or yesterday from my neighbor, who is uh, Dan Green, mm -hmm. who many of you may know. Uh, and he went up to Dark Skies in New Hampshire and imaged that just the other day. It was awesome. Yeah, look at the green color. I know, that's, that, that's... Nice shot, Doug. Yeah, that's great. The uh, Galaxy up there. Is it still in the morning now? No, it's, it's the evening. The evening. It, it's, it's actually, it's hour, actually it's both. It's when it, uh, you got to get into the trees. Uh, it's, it's actually both, but you got to get up. It's, not, it's more favorable in the evening skies than in the morning skies. Um, I also uh, was able to image it again a night before last, and uh, I'll post those when I have them in the process. The um, the green color is from uh, the the exotic molecules <clears throat> the exotic molecule C two. And for all you chemistry buffs, remember chemistry one hundred and one you all took in high school. Try and draw a loose structure for that if you can. <laughs> uh, you can't. So it's pretty cool. Um, what else? There's a, a, a penumbral lunar eclipse on March twenty fifth. Uh, in the early morning hours of that day, with the greatest penumbral extent, 95.6% at 3.13 in the morning. Um, and there were the circumstances, again, uh, um, you, can, you can see how close the moon approaches the umbra. There should be definitely a noticeable darkening if you happen to be up in the middle of the night that night, or you stay up to actually watch it. So, um, just say again. Oh, sorry. Um, so that's it for eclipses, right? <laughs> wait, no, wait, the eclipse. You know, this is the, I, I added these, this slide and the next one to Corey's to the slide deck because I'm so busy thinking about the eclipse, I forgot to think about the eclipse. And I sent him slides without even mentioning this. I don't know where you'll all be on April 8th. Some of you will be still in the Boston area, some of you will travel far and wide. But I, um, I'm hopeful that the weather will be, um, it will be nice. Here's the, here's the, the map of uh, how the path of totality uh, runs across the country. Um, I know we have a lot of members heading to Texas. Um, Glenn's been threatening to drive to Missouri. Uh, I'm going to be up in Maine with grandkids. We'll see what happens. But there it is. That map looked better uh, in, on the, online. Looks ugly when it's up in the middle, but that's it. How many people are going far and wide? Anybody, anybody traveling to the eclipse? They, that's why we have very few star parties scheduled that week because um, no one's going to be around to help out. So good. Well, good luck. I hope the clouds. Um, I hope everything behaves. Could we get a stretch of weather like we just had? Oh. Uh, can we save one of those days? The April 8th, please? Um, anyway. Oh, there was a great article in Sky and Telescope magazine. Kelly, I don't know if it was, or Diana, I don't know if it was yesterday or this morning by uh, Jay uh, Anderson, Anderson talking about weather prospects and how to gauge where to sort of, how to beat out the clouds. So if you go on the Sky and Telescope website, just click on that article. It's a great article. Um, I think it'll, it'll, it'll be pretty helpful. I decided to pick on Castor this month because um, I was thinking about daytime observing. If you're, if, you, if you're good at finding planets in the daytime, you can also find stars in the daytime. And Castor is a beautiful star to look at in the daylight. Bright, double star. It's actually a very multiple star system. But um, if, even if you can't find it at daylight, check it out at, at night there. It is an absolutely beautiful pair of double stars that you know, we all know where it is, right? You just have to remember to go look at it. Glenn, you must have seen this a thousand times, right? Yeah, I'll talk about it in a second here. Oh, all right, because I'm going to move on from that. Okay, Glenn, let me just uh, butt in here. Um, I, the first time I ever got in the uh, Sky and Telescope magazine was because of the star. Back around the 1970s, it has a very elongated orbit, and there's a period when the two stars are closest together, which happened back around 1970, late 60s. You could, you could hardly separate them at all, even with a large telescope. So I started looking at that little three-inch telescope I was telling you about a couple of meetings ago, and I was able to split them. They were just under two arc seconds apart at that time. They sent a little message to Sky and Telescope, and didn't they mention one of their observing reports? So, and I got to tell you, back then it was the first time I'd ever seen my name in a magazine. It was the most exciting thing I'd ever seen. She ran and showed my wife. Look, there was somebody from Switzerland. The other person that reported splitting that. Now it's nice and wide. What am I getting now? About five arc seconds of there? Five point two arc seconds. It's, it's a gem. It's the best double star in the northern hemisphere. Of course, Alpha Centauri has it beat by by a mile, but in the northern hemisphere, and this will be nice and split for at least a couple of hundred years. I forget what the actual uh, cycle is for that star. By the way, each of these 
is a spectroscopic binary. So those are binary pairs. Now, I don't know which of these. I think this was a Jeremy Perez sketch. But there is a red dwarf. It's, I'm going to say, about 100 arc seconds away and probably about 8th to ninth magnitude. That orbits the system. It's a spectroscopic binary. So what you have here is a stellar dance. You have two couples doing this. My fingers won't go all the way around, but you get the idea. They're doing this, and then this other star is out here dancing around them. So six stars for the price of one. Interesting thing, by the way, it's Alpha Geminorum, but it's actually the lesser of the two. Uh, the beta star Pollux is a little bit brighter. So when you're looking up there, it's the one that looks a little bit fainter. That's Castor. And taking time to look at it, it is a beauty. Stunning. You have two beautiful white stars. Fantastic. So that's why I picked on that one. I'm trying to inspire you all to become double star observers, you know, <laughs> um, at least when it's when the moon's out, right? Mario, you, you go you go look at doubles when the moon's out, right? <laughs> and when it's full moon, I hide in the basement. <laughs> I, I actually do too. <laughs> Let me see. All right, what's next here? Um, Glenn, you want okay, to? Yeah, well, your, your notes. Oh, I can't read them. I forgot my glasses. I don't even know why oh. I brought this thing up. Let's see if I'm looking on mine. I think we'll be okay. All right, the, uh, the observer's challenge for March is the Planetary Nebula NGC 2440. And uh, I talked about this last month, and Steve uh, Clardy was nice enough to say where you'd find it. I said going from here, but actually, in this group right from here, M47 should be right about here. That's a nice cluster, open cluster. Okay, that shows up better there. And if you go from, let me see the pointer. Oh, Might as well do oh, this right. right. Oh, this this button right. Okay. M47, M, now I looked at with a 10 inch, M46 is actually somewhat on the obscure side, but this thing still stands out right in the finer scope. So what I did, actually, I did start from, uh, from Sirius, but I just went across to this area right here. It's a nice group of stars, and M47 is right about here. I'm going to point to this star down here, and I couldn't identify that star. Um, these stars were in the constellation Puppis, and this star, none of my atlases have a name, and it's a fifth magnitude star. It was kind of a curiosity. I don't know, this used to be a big constellation called Argo Navis, the ship, and they broke it into different parts, and it might be that that particular constellation was in one of the constellations, and then when they changed the boundaries, it switched, I don't know. But anyway, I went to that fifth magnitude star. All of a sudden, this thing isn't working. I'll go back to that slide there. The bottom button. Yeah. Well, that makes it go on the bottom. There we go. All right, go back. Anyway, it was about three degrees south of that. And you see it right here in that area. And uh, it's kind of hard to see. That's a very small grouping. So we'll go to the next slide. We have a couple well, of I was, was going to say, that's why I put this slide on, onto it. Because in, in the first slide, it looks like it's in just this open area of the sky where there's not much to look at. But the trick is to get to M46. And like yeah. you said, M47 is bright. M46 is a bit obscure. Um, but get to M46, drop three degrees south. Yep. This is the star I was talking about. And then I, figured, I followed a trail of stars. There's a couple of patterns I went by. Remember this group right here? And then went down to here. And it doesn't show well here, but there's a nebula. There's a star here, maybe about eighth magnitude, and there's a, a neat double star, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But that's, that's the area that I found. And if, you, if you're struggling to find 2440, go back up to M46 and take a look at 2438 that little planetary that's sort of superimposed in front of the cluster. It, it's faint, so it, and, but it responds really well to a, a UHC or an Oxy-3 filter. And um, it's, it's a fun little object to look at. A hand up, I see. I uh, just want to say, if you have a well-aligned equatorial model, just drop right down three degrees, you know, right in the middle. Three degrees in declination, right? Good. You did that the other night, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, he was, he's on an equatorial mount instead of a dog. And on an equatorial mm -hmm. mount, as, as long as you're polar aligned, just drop it three degrees in declination, yeah. and there it is. Um, it's a relatively faint planetary, this guy here. So filters, if you've got them. Dark sky, if you've got it. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, Dark Paul's image right here. And I'm going to just point this. The image right there, I've got this. And the star right there, kind of a yellowish star. That's, again, I thought it was about 8th magnitude, 7th or 8th magnitude, as I recall. We'll go to the next slide now. Dark Paul has, uh, actually, this is Mario's image. And I've slanted this different. I believe north is this way, but I slanted it because my sketch is going to show it's the same organization. But here's the nebula right here. It's called the butterfly or the insect nebula. And there's that yellowish star. And then up here, there's a triple star. And I just want you to notice the orientation here. This is, again, what scope is this, Mario? 
32. 32-inch. Now take a look at what it looked like with a 3-inch. And this is out of my notebook. I, again, I've been keeping notes since the 1970s, so I referred back to this. And I did look at NGC 20, 2440 a couple of weeks ago with my 10-inch scope, and it was so faint in that big, for me, big scope, that I thought I couldn't have seen that with a little three inch. So I got this notebook out, and we'll go back to Mario's image again. We'll go to the other reverse, and there's a nebula. There's a star there, bright one, and there's that wide double star. Now go to my sketch. This again was made with a three inch telescope. Geez, almost 50 years ago, 40 anyway. There's a nebula. Now one thing, go back to Mario's again real quick. I'm not driving you crazy. <coughs> Look at the size. Got to back up again. Good, Look at the size there. of that. Look at that double star. Now that is about 30 arc seconds. It's a double star called uh, Hussey, I forget, 709 I think it is. It doesn't matter, but it's a wide double star. I estimate it to be about 10th magnitude each, or 9th magnitude each star, and about 30 arc seconds separation in a north-south orientation. I think the nebula was 46 arc seconds. Something like that. I know, well, I'll tell you where I got it. One of the books, it said 74 by 46. It gave a pretty wide size, which I couldn't figure. But let's go back again. I'm sorry for going back and forth. <laughs> but here's 30 arc seconds anyway, 25. You look at the size of that. Now go to my sketch. There's a double star. And look at the size there. So all I was able to pick up was that bright central part of that nebula. The butterfly wings, you'd need either a large aperture telescope or an image of some type. It's a beautiful sight and it's very easy. I just mentioned, I saw a little three inch telescope and about 60 power. And just a quick addition, I went further south in the constellation Antlia that same night and I looked at Zeta 1 Antlia and it's a beautiful pair. Uh, they're both about, it says right there, they're about six magnitude, six and a half, about eight arc second separation. It's a beauty. The problem is it's about 32, 33 degrees south. So I have a lot of trouble with atmospheric turbulence. Uh, but it's a beautiful sight. Again, these are notes that I made way back in uh, 1979. This is on papyrus. It's so old. <laughs> <laughs> Three whole papyrus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and next one, I've already looked at this one. I, I've been talking to you about how a lot of these challenges now are getting harder and harder. I'm getting a little discouraged. And when I heard of Hickson 44, a galaxy cluster, a group of galaxies, there's no way, but I did check it out with a 10 inch. And I was able to see, and I forget the numbers already, it's, uh, is this 3193? That's, I can't remember. Yeah, I forget. Anyway, there's an elliptical galaxy here, and then there's a spiral here. And I saw these two with the 10 inch. This one was very easy. This is about uh, maybe almost 11th magnitude. This one's a little fainter than 11th. And there's one, I believe it's this one right here, that I could barely see. So I did pick out two with a 10 inch under magnitude 5 sky, so it is visible. I doubt you'd see it with a small aperture telescope, but you know what, if you went out to an area we have really dark skies, you could probably pick some of these up with a four-inch telescope. But, but that's a challenge for next month. It's doable, definitely. It's actually fairly easy to find. It's right in the sickle of the light. Oh, middle. It's, re it's really easy to yeah, find. Yeah, go ahead and back it up. So there we go. It's right between. This is the, the sickle of Leo the Lion. And by the way, Gamma, magnificent double star. So if you're going to check it out, I star hop from here. Because this nice pair of stars that led me right down there. I was able to star hop to it. But check this one out as well. This is one of the most beautiful double stars. I call it a top 10 double star. So if you've seen Castor and you want to go to Hickson 44, just check out Gamma Leonis as well. Beauty. And I think that's it. Well, there's one more. There, there's, well, there's, there, there's my summary of all of it. Do we have a, we, do we put Here's one, your pointer. Do we put one up for next month? Do we not have a suffer next month? What's next month? Is well, next month is Hickson. It's another Hickson. And then May is Hickson 68, so that's another oh, group so, of galaxies. So next month, right, for April, it's, it's Hickson 44. 44. Yeah. And, then, and then for May, it's Hickson 68. Right. Which is called a box. There are four galaxies that are nicely visible. We'll talk about yeah. that next month. But um, there aren't many Hickson groups that are easy for us to see because you don't have to put a galaxy all that far away before they get pretty faint. But some of them are pretty bright, and they're, they're fun to look at because you'll see more than one galaxy in the same eyepiece field. So that's, kind of, that's always kind of fun. And this is sort of a, a summary of them all. I like to look at Ke uh, Keppel and, uh, I can't even remember Keppel and Sanner? Keppel and Sanner. They give NGC 2440 four stars, 3190 four stars, and uh, it, I guess I pushed it out for May, Hickson 68, three stars. But um, give them a try. And if you're so inclined, write up a little report and send it off to Roger and Sue French. and. Roger will put it on his like his 
put in the report and it gets read by thousands of people all over the world. So that's something to do. I think that might be it. Ah, yes. It's always keep looking up. Yep. So with that, um, we'll introduce our speaker. Unfortunately, she's feeling a little under the weather, so she'll be remote, but we're perfectly set up for that, so it'll be an easy transition. Mm -hmm. So our guest speaker is Miranda Ivan, and she'll be telling a tale of two telescopes. She's a fifth-year PhD student at the Harvard University's astronomy department, and she'll be discussing uh, system, systems engineering for modern telescopes by comparing two millimeter radio instruments that she's personally worked on. We'll see how the high level goals can impact the design choices at the smallest levels throughout a project. So please welcome Miranda. And for Miranda, you are our co host, and you should be able to present whenever. So, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes. I hear you. All right, sweet. So, I uh, apologize for being a bit under the weather and for the th uh, frog in my throat and if I sniffle at all during this presentation. Um, so, as the introduction said, I'm going to be talking about systems engineering. Um, this is uh, the systems engineering V, which is essentially the main framework of systems engineering. So, as a preamble, we're going to work through the systems engineering V really quickly. Um, you start at the top at number one with the kind of broad concept of operations. Uh, and then you move down the V into more detailed and detailed design aspects until you finally get to what most people consider most of the engineering, uh, which is an implementation stage. Uh, and then uh, you move back up the V out to broader and broader um, testing implementations uh, with the idea that you are setting requirements at the broadest stage that you will then test at the last stage. And each is interconnected. Um, we're going to ignore uh, half of it, <laughs> because otherwise this would take too long, um, and then move into the actual talk. So this is the framework of this talk as we go. So Tale of Two Telescopes by me, Miranda Ivan. As said, uh, I'm a fifth year PhD student. I work with John Kovac on millimeter telescopes, but I'm a Massachusetts native, and I actually started out my astronomy career at UMass Amherst with Grant Wilson. Um, so I've been working on millimeter telescopes for a while. Um, our two case studies are Toltec, which is the instrument that I worked on in my undergrad career. You can see UMass is uh, represented in this, this little uh, logo. And we're going to be versus bicep array, which is the current uh, experiment that I work on. And starting at the top for the concept of operations. So the two telescopes, Toltec and bicep. Uh, the concept for Toltec is that it's a general science survey instrument for the large millimeter telescope. So it kind of fills a millimeter wavelength niche in between smaller single dish telescopes and interferometers. Uh, so Toltec is replacing the previous camera called Aztec on the LMT with more detectors. This is a picture of the LMT at the bottom here. Um, bicep. My space, there we go, bicep, um, wants to constrain the tensor to scalar ratio R of primordial gravitational waves, which could be direct evidence of inflation. We'll go into that a little bit more. So they want to observe something that's a really low signal um, against uh, something that is everywhere, basically. Bicep array is a replacement for the previous array of receivers, Keck array, again with more detectors. So nominally kind of same goals between these two receivers. This is a picture of Keck array. Now, and I just want to note for the record, because, you know, you might be somewhat familiar with radio dishes. This yellow circle around uh, the LMT, that is the main dish. It's 50 meters. Um, so that's where the main collecting area of the light is. Um, for Keck array, this uh, red uh, uh, line here does not denote the collecting area of Keck array. That is the ground shield. The actual collecting areas are those five little circles in the center. <laughs> so actually very different um, architecture between these two instruments. All right, observations, Toltec, um, main surveys for Toltec can be broken up in uh, one way, basically, I'd say. 
you can look at things that are very far away in the millimeter, and you can look at things that are very close to home in the millimeter. So as mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the people at Haystacks are working on a kind of similar uh, range of uh, stuff in the millimeter that's very close and very far away. So for the far away, we're going to break up into four different kind of main surveys that Toltec is going to be working on. For the far away, there's an ultra deep galaxy survey. So in the millimeter, you can really probe some of those earliest galaxies um, out to redshifts of like, you know, redshifts 10, which is very, very deep um, and very, very far away. Something that's a little bit more close to home is a large scale structure survey. It's a larger uh, degree field than the ultra deep survey. So there's a, a there's a balancing act that you have to do at the millimeter between something where you get high sensitivity and therefore you can't cover as much of a large area or relatively low sensitivity and you can cover a very large area to to less de depth. Uh, the, the large-scale structure survey is meant to supplement other large-scale structure surveys, some of which are being held at the CFA, um, like uh, if you've heard of DESI, uh, which is being run out of Kitt Peak, um, those kind of things where you're, you're trying to get stuff that's much closer but still extragalactic. So think like red shifts of like two uh, maximum. Um, and then we look also at the fields and filament survey, where we're looking at the polarization um, of filamentary structures in the dust in the galaxy. Again, a very small uh, square degree survey, and also a clouds to core survey, where a much larger square degree survey, where um, they are looking for the little cores that will eventually form into stars within these kind of large filamentary structures. So very broad range of science that Toltec is trying to uh, cover. And then also it's meant to be a, uh, a, 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 a you can, uh, <laughs> you can uh, ask for time on Toltec to look at your own observations. Bicep is a completely different structure. Bicep only cares about the CMV. Um, the CMV is the cosmic microwave background. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, You'll notice, I don't know if you can see my background, but my background is another picture of the, old, uh, the, the cosmic microwave background. So the cosmic microwave background, oldest light in the universe. Um, you can think of it kind of like the universe's baby picture. This is the Planck all sky um, picture of the all time uh, of the, uh, the CMB. Um, and so what we're seeing here is we're seeing small deviations in temperature from uh, the perfect black body that the CMB represents. One of the things that we can do with this, we can do a lot, uh, but one of them is that we can take a Fourier transform of these patterns that we see in the temperature and isotropies, and we can see patterns in it. And this can tell us um, about the conditions of the very early universe before um, we had this surface of last scattering that is what the CMB is. Um, so, what you can also do is you can look at the different polarization states of the light. So if we decompose the polar the linear polarization of the light into the divergence pattern of that polarization, we get something like this. This is what we call E modes. And you can see it's a very similar pattern, but it's slightly different. So this can tell us slightly different things about the conditions of the early universe. And then if we look at the curl pattern of the polarization state, um, we can see this other pattern. Um, this is what we call B modes. Um, and you can see here that we've gone down pretty significantly in the spectral power. So up at the temperature and isotropies, we're on kind of the millikelvin level, uh, where the CMB is about three Kelvin. Um, and then at the E modes, we've gone down three orders of magnitude. Um, and in the B modes, we've gone down another three orders of magnitude. So we're looking at really low sensitivity um, signals, really low power signals. So this takes a lot of time. We have to do a really deep survey to try and constrain these small, uh, very low power signals in the CMB uh, because they are just completely blown out by the other signals that we are getting. Uh, you'll also notice that there's this really big bump 
Um, this is actually not primordial. This is E modes that have passed by galaxy clusters um, and then have gotten lensed slightly. That's why they're called lensing B modes um, to into the, the curl polarization pattern. So um, BICEP is meant to uh, target this very narrow range where the primordial stuff that might tell us about how inflation happened, if inflation happened, um, should be around a degree scale or a multiple number of around 100. Um, and the other stuff that has been uh, moved into the B modes uh, by the, the galaxy structures in the universe um, peaks further out. So we're trying to target a very narrow uh, scale. Well, you'll notice is actually really big. Uh, we do not care that much about resolution. Um, we really want the high sensitivity. So why the millimeter? Well, so this is a bunch of uh, Planck maps at a bunch of different frequencies. And you'll notice that, so remember, Toltec wants to observe galactic dust emission, redshifted UV and IR extragalactic emission to some moderate resolution in between, filling a niche. Um, and so it really cares about this kind of dust dominant uh, regime uh, at the highest frequencies between around 150 to 350. Um, BICEP, in contrast, wants to observe the CMB, which is around a three Kelvin black body. So its emission is peaks around uh, 150 to 100 gigahertz. Um, so BICEP really, really cares about that range. And then they both somewhat kind of care about the synchrotron dominated region um, at the lowest frequencies at the 30, 40 gigahertz range. So Toltec observes um, at some of these frequencies, BICEP observes at all of these frequencies. And this is where we get into telescope location. So uh, the question for a lot of astro uh, instruments <laughs> is whether to build for the ground or build for space. So uh, the atmosphere is reasonably transmissive in the millimeter. Uh, obviously, if you get higher into the infrared, uh, the atmosphere becomes not very good. Um, and But Toltec wants a moderately high resolution um, on the arc second scale. And it's very difficult to make a 50 meter dish that goes into space. Very expensive as well. Bicep wants really high sensitivity, but very low resolution. So you can send something into space, but you can't fix it. Um, so well, you can send it up there, um, but you're not going to be able to observe for a really long amount of time. Planck, the Planck satellite went up, um, I think in 2008, 2009, and it observed for four years. BICEP, by contrast, has had some iteration of a telescope down at South Pole, we'll get there in a second, um, for the past 15 years. Um, and we can do that partially because we can get to it and we can fix things, um, makes it a lot easier. So we're building stuff in the ground. And then the next question becomes, where in the world are you going to build this? So you need a high desert. Um, so uh, we'll get to this in a second, but you really don't want water vapor. Um, and so if you look at the precipital water vapor, uh, here the darker colors in this map are better. You can see there's really only a few places in the world that have really low precipital water vapor. Um, so deserts tend to be at latitudes plus or minus 15 degrees to 30 degrees around the equator. Um, so that's places like Mexico, Chile, and Australia. Other geographical conditions like distance from the ocean can also decrease the amount of water vapor. So that's places like South Pole or Tibet. So, and Toltec doesn't really care that much about sensitivity. Uh, it really cares about its ability to be built. Um, so uh, uh, UMass teamed up with a uh, Mexican astronomical society to build uh, on the fifth tallest mountain in Mexico. Uh, which is pretty good. But BICEP really cares about the sensitivity, which we'll get to in a second. So we built at South Pole. Um, and we built at South Pole partially because of the transmission. So you can see here, this is the transmission from zero to 400 gigahertz um, at, at both sites. 
Um, and you can see what we've got here are different lines that we're uh, avoiding with the bands that we're designing around. So there's two bands, uh, uh, absorption bands uh, that are oxygen. Can't really do much about that when you're on Earth. You can just try to get as high as possible. And then there's two bands that really are annoying, which are water, which is why precipital water vapor is so important. So you can see here, even in a desert um, in Mexico, uh, there's really variable water vapor above the telescope, which can really change the transmission through the atmosphere at the Toltec site, as opposed to South Pole, where we're still staying pre-transmissive, even in the worst uh, environments and the worst days, weather days that we get. So uh, obviously there's trade-offs there, it's significantly more accessible in Mexico than it is at South Pole. Uh, but still more accessible than space. Okay, requirements and architecture. Um, go through just very briefly, um, kind of the breakdown of architecture of a system. You have a system, um, and underneath that system, you have subsystems. And underneath those systems, you can have sub subsystems. And all of those systems can have really weird interactions with each other. And all of them can also be systems engineering Vs. Um, so it's system engineering Vs all the way down. Um, if we go through the architecture of millimeter telescope, you have the telescope. Um, I would break it up into optics, cryogenics, detectors, and the readout systems. Um, uh, each of these kind of major systems can be developed by um, a group of people within the collaboration. So the collaboration is for the entire telescope. Um, and then generally universities within that collaboration work on it, uh, of these subsystems. So for Toltec, the optics were designed by ASU. Uh, for Bicep Array, they're designed here at Harvard. Um, Optics obviously put some constraints onto the cryogenics because the amount of uh, light that gets absorbed by the optics and uh, that power needs to get taken out by the cryogenics. And under optics, you can have individual optical components like the lenses. Um, you can also have components like say the cryostat window, which we'll get into later in this talk. Uh, which can take uh, requirements for both the cryogenics and the optics. So you don't need to have just a straight linear down um, this diagram. You can have be pulling from two different places. Uh, you can also have, oh, and uh, those kind of components, at least uh, in these kind of projects, generally are worked on by one person. So for instance, I work on the cryostat window for bicep array. Um, you can also have components that take requirements from that subsystem level and put requirements onto the cryogenic, onto, again, the, the subsystem level. So, for instance, our detectors use superconductors, um, and because they're superconductors, that's putting requirements back onto the cryogenics. The cryogenics must be able to get the superconductors to superconducting. So, we'll go very briefly through uh, an example set of requirements that you would set for a cryostat window, which is what I work on. So, we have a problem. Um, the problem is that everything emits millimeter radiation. Anything with any temperature is going to be emitting millimeter radiation. And in any instrument, that is really going to be annoying <laughs> for your signal to noise. So, your solution is make everything cold. Okay, we have a problem in that heat transfer exists. Um, so we need to try and eliminate heat transfer as much as possible. And one way to do that is to try to eliminate the convection uh, with a vacuum. Okay, we have another problem with that in that the atmosphere is heavy. Um, another problem with that is that strong materials in the millimeter tend, tend to be very reflective or absorptive. You can't use metal because it's just gonna reflect stuff away. Um, and you can't use some other materials because they're just gonna absorb way too much of the light and not transmit as much of it. So your solution is to make a transmissive window. And at this point, then you need to set requirements for your problems that you haven't quite solved yet. You need to make sure that the window is strong enough to hold out the atmosphere and the window shouldn't absorb more than some percent of the radiation. Um, there's obviously a lot other requirements. These are just two very basic ones to get the idea going. Okay, going into detailed design. Um, I figured you guys would be very interested in this. We'll go through the optical design. Um, on the LMT, 
We have light come in, bounce off the primary dish, come out to the secondary dish, go into towards the receiver cabin, where we have other ambient temperature mirrors where everything reflects around. Then it enters the actual Toltec cryostat. This is the Toltec cryostat on the interior. Light comes in, bounces off uh, one mirror, and then goes to a dichroic where the light gets split. Um, so the 280 uh, light continue, gigahertz light continues onto a detector array, while the rest of the light goes through a lens and hits another dichroic where it is split again into two different bands, uh, one towards 150 gigahertz array and one towards a 220 gigahertz array. Bicep array, by contrast, is a little bit simpler. It is just a refractor. <laughs> um, uh, we build an individual refractor for each band. Uh, so the optics change slightly in that the things like the anti-reflection coats change, but uh, the basic design doesn't. Um, so we have light come in. It hits an objective lens. Um, here's a ray diagram of how the light goes. So it gets bent slightly by the objective, it goes towards the field, gets bent slightly again by the field, back down to uh, the focal plane. Uh, so yes, very different designs to actually get the light to where they're going. Um, times four for slightly modified for different frequencies. Um, so the light path seems a lot simpler here than it does there, but crucially, all of the light in BICEP is going through mostly cold optics, while the uh, light come going through the Toltec design has a lot of ambient temperature uh, mirrors. And again, this comes down to the sensitivity question. Um, Toltec needs to get the light to their cryostat uh, from their really big dish, while uh, BICEP really cares about the sensitivity. Each of these ambient temperature mirrors, they're going to add noise um to the signal because they're ambient temperature they can't help it um so there's there's design considerations that are happening here from the highest level down to the optical ones okay uh, because we're in the detailed design stage i can't resist talking about the window so both toltec and bicep array changed their window designs for their upgrades and why would you change something that worked for previous iterations well we can go back to our problems the problem that the atmosphere is heavy, um, and the problem that strong materials are reflective and absorptive. So then we can quickly calculate how much force something is going to be on with uh, our large apertures. And uh, we can only control so much about the materials. So for instance, absorption uh, is going to be directly related to the material properties in the material constant, the absorption constant, and the material thickness. So here's another interesting fact. Both uh, of these windows for the new receivers increase their aperture by two times. Um, and so I just moved our problems up to the top. And I'm going to give you a sense of scale. So for Keck, the Keck array, this was the scale with a little ruler of the window. And for bicep array, this is the scale of the window, <laughs> same ruler. So we've increased the aperture twice but it's, it's a lot larger. Um, so the force on the Keck array um, window is around, you know, a thousand pounds. The force on the bicep array window is like 10,000 pounds. Um, this is a lot of force that this has to, uh, this window has to keep out. By contrast, the Toltec window is around actually the size of the Keck array window. Um, so they, did increase their aperture by two times, but they had it at the same scale as other instruments. And this is very important for the decisions that the Toltec team made versus what the bicep array team made in their window design. So here's all the optical tests that I remember us running on the Toltec, or all the tests that I remember us running on the Toltec window. Um, and here's a quick sample of all the tests that I've run on the bicep array uh, window. I'm not gonna go through all of them, uh, but it's a lot more. Um, and that's because it's so much bigger. So we have an overall goal, right? Which is to get to really good sensitivity on bicep array. And that has caused us to go to a wider aperture. The wider aperture that we get, we can have more detectors um, and therefore to get higher sensitivity. But that also makes these two problems that we have with the window really bad. Uh, the atmosphere is really heavy and 
because the atmosphere is heavy, we have to make our windows thicker. Um, and because we have to make our windows thicker, that means that they're going to get more absorptive. Uh, remember, thickness is part of uh, the absorption. Um, so we have to do new window technology um, to be able to keep getting really good sensitivity. While for Toltec, what their goal is, is to get a wide range of very interesting science. So their solution is also to go to a wider aperture because that gets them more detectors. Um, but they can use windows that have been proven on other instruments. Um, they don't have to do technology demonstration because they're going to a scale that other people have already done. So the new window technology is a lot riskier. Um, and the uh, windows that are used by other instruments is already pretty well characterized, which has made a lot of the work at the lowest levels <laughs> between these two groups, right? So uh, an undergrad was doing a lot of the tests on the Toltec window uh, while I was there, and it's been my entire PhD to work on the bicep array window. <laughs> um, so there's, there's a give and a take here, but we could get a really good return. Um, by reducing the thickness of the window at those sensitivities. So the end of the talk, uh, just as a wrap up. Uh, so at the highest level, we've got the concept of operations for Toltec, which is general microwave survey science versus bicep arrays, very specific experimental physics. And that has made both of them do something seemingly on its surface very similar, which is go to wider apertures and add more detectors. Um, but at the detailed design level, that has led to wildly different outcomes. And I think that's very interesting, personally, that you can have these very high level design decisions that will trickle down to even the smallest decisions that you're making on the day to day basis of the design. So next step, obviously, is implementation, um, which we are currently doing on both of these receivers. Toltec, I think, is down at the LMT right now observing. Bicep Array, we have new receivers that are going out right now. Um, and I just also want to acknowledge that it takes a village to make a telescope. These are both collaborations that I've worked on here. It's a lot of people. Um, and uh, it's been a very great learning opportunity to work with some of these really great scientists. So uh, that's the end of my talk. I uh, want to open up to questions. Um, yeah. Yeah, great talk. Why is the uh, background uh, uh, microwave radiation polarized in two opposite directions? Oh, that's a very good question. Let me see. You can still see my screen, right? I've got okay. another presentation up. I might have that. <clears throat> Don't have that. Shoot. <laughs> okay, so um, it's because of the uh, the electron fields in the early universe. So you had a highly polarized plasma. It's like the surface of the sun, basically, um, where you know you have you don't have atoms. You just have plasma. So you have a lot of charged particles moving around in a big soup. Um, and so the photons couldn't get very far because everything was so dense at that point and hot. And so. Uh, because you have a lot of electrons just freely moving around, basically, you do end up with um, these different, uh, you end up with a lot of Thomson scattering. And depending on the temperature field um, in that the electrons are around, there's a preferential direction for the Thomson scattering. I hope this is making sense. <laughs> And so you end up with um, a pattern, essentially, where because the electron is seeing this kind of quadrupole moment, um, you end up with one direction where you just get more Thompson scattering than the other direction. And that happens for basically every electron in the universe um, at that point. And so you end up with a wide field of these different, slight, very, very slightly different polarization patterns. Um, and then depending on like the density field um, or uh, gravitational waves, you can get slightly different patterns. So that, that is actually what we're trying to see with the B modes. Um, 
in, let me go back to the curl pattern. Um, here. Um, what you're seeing in the B modes, hypothetically, if we actually get to see inflation, let me present so we can see. Um, if inflation happens, there should have been, there should be primordial gravitational waves, um, like what LIGO detects, um, that would have also perturbed those electrons in the early universe um, in a different pattern um, than the typical one that you see here, uh, which is which are the density perturbations that you see from the early universe. Um, and because it's a slightly different pattern, um, it produces a different polarization field. Uh, there's no way to produce this curl pattern with the known physics from the early universe, which is mainly density perturbations. So density waves going through that primordial plasma. Um, while the gravitational waves should be able to induce uh, the, the curl pattern uh, preferentially. It which should also produce E modes, but the E mode, it, it's completely swamped out by um, the regular density field perturbations of the E modes. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that makes sense. I don't have a good diagram to show the electrons. There's a question in the back. Hi. Uh, I'm curious, maybe I don't understand gravitational waves, but what would have caused gravitational waves other than, I guess, if there was expansion, maybe that would create gravitational waves? If the That's exactly it. Um, it's that so expansion that creates those that's what you're looking for then the, that, that is exactly what we're looking for is because inflation being a theory where the universe expanded faster than the speed of light this, this, this you're 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 naturally tapping into the stuff that I'm least familiar with <laughs> um, um, so uh, because uh, the the if inflation happened so quickly quickly, it should have produced these very small gravitational waves. Um, and these very small gravitational waves should have done something to the primordial plasma that we are hoping to pick up. And so the interesting thing here, and I don't have a good slide for this, um, is that uh, our collaboration, you know, with Bicep Tech, this is Bicep 2, we are currently on technically generation 4. Um, of the bicep experiment, we we have put such good constraints on the power of those gravitational waves, essentially, that we've actually ruled out entire paradigms of inflationary theories. Um, so, like very popular paradigms of inflationary theories, where people are like this this could be how it happened, and then we didn't measure the gravitational waves at that power. Um, and so now people are some of the theorists are having to go back to the drawing board. Um, and over the next decade, we're really hoping to really, really put really good upper constraints. So um, we're at like, you know, equivalent of like nano Kelvin scales, and we want to get down to like pico Kelvin scales, I think. Um, so much lower. I think. I'm remembering my prefix is right. Uh, there's a question over there. Hello. I guess a mechanical question as much as anything else. You uh, showed what I gather from, if I understand HGP and yeah. high density polyethylene optics. And yes. I was curious um, how those were fabricated. Are they diamond turned? And so, so we mill them. Um, I'm not very familiar with exactly how. Well, we don't mill them, we lathe them. Um, I'm not exactly sure how, what like bit tips they use, um, but you know, HDP is really soft um, compared to glass. Um, so I have a good picture. I'm wondering about that. Is there a problem with creep or is that not a problem yes. in the cryostat because it's so, so cold? It's not, it's not a problem in a cryostat because it's it shouldn't be moving under its own weight. Um, the window, we do have to worry about creep. I do have creep tests here. Um, but since we have the lenses up right now, what we actually do is before we send it off to machining, we anneal it. Um, mm. So we put it into, because 
Uh, okay, so there's two things that we have to do there. We have to specifically get cast HDPE. Um, and we have to get cast HDPE because um, a collaborator has actually found that extruded HDPE can be birefringent. <laughs> so we have to get cast HDPE because hypothetically, the way that the extrusion is making the HDPE birefringent to the microwaves is because the polymers have a preferred orientation in the casting, in the extrusion process. Um, while the cast stuff, you know, you do get, uh, you know, differential contraction as it cools in its big block, but hypothetically, when we anneal it, we're reducing that stress. So we have had problems in the past when we are uh, lathing uh, the big lenses, and if they're not annealed prior, that when we AR coat them, which also takes a heat cycle, then they deform. Um, so we do have to anneal to make sure that they don't deform. Um, I think they've also deformed during the lathing process as well, because, you know, the lathe heats up um, the area immediately around the bit. Um, so we do have to do a very slow uh, uh, heat cycle of the big blanks before we get them. And then they send them back and we do another heat cycle um, to make sure that any stresses that were built up in the initial rough cut um, uh, aren't, don't stay in for the, the fine cut. That they do so we do two annealing processes with the lenses as for creep <laughs> we do worry about the creep on the window uh and that's because i'm just gonna move this we have stuff directly below the window um and the window is really thin um so we have these uh infrared blockers which are made of zoot foam um right below the window and we don't want the window to creep into that um so we have done very long creep tests uh, for about a month, um, and the creep of polyethylene is pretty well known. So uh, we expect that you know this this fitted deflection and the fitted radial strain should uh, remain consistent. And the student that I had who was working on this, Sage Christian, um, he he calculated uh, with the appropriate like offsets and stuff uh, because we we also have offset the window slightly with a uh, ring um, that it will make contact with the foam filters that are directly below it in like a million years or something crazy like that. So we're, we're really good at it. It, it, it creep treats us well because it's logarithmic. So, um, you know, it, it takes a while to get any further than it's already gotten. Um, yeah, so. Great. Uh, question in the far back. Okay back and talk about the right side of the knee. Um, I'm interested to know that when you're building an instrument to look for something that no one has seen before, mm -hmm. you have an absence of the signal, how can you be certain that that's the reality instead of a problem with the instrument? That is a great question. Um, and not actually something that I work directly on. Um, and I don't have any good slides for it because of that. Um, but a huge portion of our collaboration does what we call beam maps, where we have a source at pole. And I wish I had a good picture of this, like off can, but I don't. So we have two different instruments. I hope you can see my fingers. <laughs> we have two different instruments that are 200 meters apart at pole. And what we do is we put a really big mast and we put a chopper up there. And uh, so the chopper is at ambient temperature, it's got absorbers on it. Um, and then the sky is cold, right? So we can uh, know the frequency at which the chopper signal is going and we can figure out essentially, as we scan our beams from each individual detector across that, we can map the shape of the beams. Um, and so then what we do is we have, okay, I do have a picture of the detectors in here, I think. Um, our detectors are a little, I don't have a good picture of the detectors in here, dang it. Um, our detectors are, uh, the antennas are orthogonal. So we've got two coplanar detectors. They're basically right on top of each other. And so what we actually do when we're taking a polarization signal is we just difference the two. Uh, we just literally subtract out the signal. But a big problem with that could be, well, is if the beam with one detector 
is different than the beam of the other, when you just do that subtraction, then you could not actually be seeing an astronomical signal, you could be seeing an instrumental signal. Um, and so we do a, the beam mapping is meant to basically, we are fitting the way the beam looks in, with a known source, which should be a point source because it should be in the far field at 200 meters. Um, with a known source, we can go, this is what the beam looks like. And we have a bunch of parameters that we put into that. Um, and for this detector, the A detector, which is arbitrarily one of the orthogonal uh, detectors, and this is what the B detector looks like. And what this is what the subtraction between those two beams looks like. Um, and we can try to model out what that is. And then because we have a few thousand detectors, the idea is that that kind of averages out. One of the things that we do is like we rotate the telescope. So I didn't go into this, but that's the reason that BICEP is a uh, refractor, um, just a nice uh, uniplanar, you know, symmetric refractor is because we rotate it. Um, so when we're scanning the sky over our field, uh, we spend about 10 schedules um, or 10 phases looking at one orientation. So the detectors are scanning across the sky at one orientation. And then we set, spend another 10 phases, uh, which each are about 10 hours at a different angle. And we do that again. So different detectors at different angles are going to be going over the same portion of the sky, which should also be a, allow us to work out if there's any instrumental effects. However, if there is a signal that is that is not symmetric like that, like for instance, uh, I have a graduate student just graduated from our lab, uh, James Cornelison, he's looking for cosmic birefringence, which would mean that light from the CMB has a preferred direction because the, there's a phase offset in the light from the CMB. And to make that measurement, we do have to have a very precise understanding of what the polarization of our detectors are, which is an incredibly difficult measurement. He has spent you know, seven years on that. And he's not the first one in our collaboration to do that. Um, it's it's incredibly difficult because you have to know precisely what the polarization of your sort your calibrating beam source is relative to the telescope. And you have to like because our telescopes aren't meant to look at the horizon, you have to really precisely know the mirror that we use to redirect the beams, what angle and what like uh, what curvature that mirror might have um it's just incredibly difficult under normal circumstances we don't have to do that because we're just taking that difference and we have a good understanding of what the two beams look like between the two we can model that out hopefully that's the idea um so yes hypothetically we could have to understand what's going on with the instrument uh if we want to do um other science but we don't have to for our regular science because of the way that we set up the survey. So, question over here. Hey, thanks for the talk. I'm wondering how you use the superconductors in your instrumentation setup. I think you mentioned that earlier. Yes. Uh, okay. So, I mentioned very briefly that, you know, everything emits microwaves. <laughs> so, um, a way to make the detectors be very sensitive is to go very cold, right? Um, and so both Toltec and BICEP use superconductors. They use superconductors in slightly different ways. Um, Toltec has a uh, inductor capacitor circuit um, where the resonating capacitor, you can change uh, like essentially the area that the capacitor is over and therefore change the resonant frequency of that detector. And then because as photons come in, they are also changing the inductance of the circuit because uh, it's breaking Cooper pairs in the superconductor. Um, you can measure how this resonant fre frequency shifts uh, when light comes in. Um, this is a pretty new technology. I'd say it's, it's probably 15 years old-ish um, in some capacity. They're called uh, KIDS, kinetic inductance detectors. Um, and so 
as your photons come in, they change L and the resonant frequency changes. So once you know what resonant frequency a given detector is at, you can figure out how much light it saw um, because of the induction stage. Voltaic is, slight, uh, is using slightly newer technology. Biceps using slightly older technology. TESs or uh, transition edge sensors uh, I have existed in some form since the 80s. Um, and what they do is they bias this little superconducting circuit on the superconducting transition. And then as light comes in, it changes the temperature slightly and therefore changes the resistance slightly. And then we amplify that with a squid, uh, which is another kind of superconducting circuit. It's a Josephson junction. If you uh, <laughs> studied very advanced physics. <laughs> and uh, because uh, that resistance and that temperature has changed slightly. What we do to measure that is we essentially cancel that out with another circuit going through this. Um, so, go to the next slide. The, the way that you multiplex um, these detector circuits is very different. Um, and it's kind of the opposite reason that you use both detectors that what you did for the windows is that Toltec can take a, a noise hit, a sensitivity hit for new technologies here um, for the detectors. So they're using something that's pretty, pretty new, while BICEP really wants to understand the noise properties of its detectors. So it's using something much older for its detector technology. Um, so like there's there's a, a, a different switch here. Um, and so yes, we use superconductors in the detectors uh, because of that problem where you know everything emits microwaves. Um, and this also allows us to get really, really sensitive um, detectors. So we're both of these instruments hypothetically should be photon noise limited. It's just that uh, the photons, there's many more photons in Toltec's case than there are in Bicep's case. Um, yeah, hypothetically should be photon noise limited. Awesome. Uh, unless there's any other questions online, we might wrap up. Sounds like no, but uh, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. Very thank you. Thank you. The design loop and methodology, you can see some smaller, simpler parallels when it comes to building telescopes. You know, getting a scope, figuring out what you want to do, what you don't want to do, what important decisions. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that the systems engineering V can be used in basically any situation. Powerful tool. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, with that, I will officially close the meeting. I just want to mention our next meeting will be April 11th, which is only three days after the eclipse. So it might be, you know, a partial crew here. I think a lot of people will still be out and about traveling. So it might not be a full normal meeting. Uh, we will have the nominating committee, which we may have to attempt to do like an online vote, just if there's not enough bodies here to, to vote or just give people more time and flexibility if everyone's scattered across the country to be able to vote. So. Will there be enough people, somebody here to do the Zoom? You will be here. I'll, I'll, I'll be here too. <laughs> so with that, the meeting's closed. I'll bring the lights up. <laughs>